Hello everyone, we're taking December off. Feel free to imagine us out laying on some tropical beach somewhere, enjoying the holidays and drinking the sorts of drinks that come with tiny umbrellas and a fruit salad. It's not true, of course. We're stuck at home just like you, but go ahead and imagine it anyway. We've once again bundled up the bonus episodes we put out for our top tier supporters, which we call footnotes. They make two nearly hour-long collections for you to listen to, one this week and one two weeks from now, and we sincerely hope you enjoy them. If you'd like to get them when and as they release, head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and become a member of our head librarian tier. You'll get lots of other benefits as well, like transcripts and early releases of our normal episodes. In the meantime, fix yourself up a mug of tea, and have a listen to our 2021 holiday special, Part 1. You may remember that back in June we... Well, we didn't do a lot, really. A number of things out in the big wide world imposed upon our production schedule, among them, a much-needed vacation. In all, we only managed to produce two episodes one discussing the merchant and one discussing, or rather, rediscussing with additions, the man gauche. You'll recall in Merchant we discussed not only the role of the merchant in society and in your game, but also some basic economic facts involving both sheep and pots. And in man gauche, we corrected an error made so long ago no one really remembers it besides us, which resulted in an episode so bad we pulled it from the feed. A re-record and a bit of extra information made it all better, and we could finally move on with our lives, just like real human beings. And since we threw just about everything we had into Merchant, and didn't really turn up anything new to add to Man Gauche, beyond what made it into the new episode, we're kind of stuck. We need a bonus episode, but we haven't really got anything to bonus with. So, how's things with you then? Oh, that's good, good. Uh, nice weather, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How about those Dodgers? Oh, this is never going to work. We'll never fill eight to ten minutes this way. Might as well just break a rule and get on with it. So here's a bonus episode containing additional information about a thing which we did not speak about in the previous month. In fact, you could say this goes all the way back to sarcophagus, though at the time this wasn't in that episode either, nor any subsequent Lost episode about it. It's just something we ran across recently that was interesting and can maybe spice up your game for you in quite extraordinary ways. And that's about as much as it takes to get on the radar around here. The word sarcophagus, as you'll know from the original episode, is made up of two Greek words, sarkos, meaning flesh, and phagus, meaning to eat. Which makes perfect sense when you recall that many of them were initially made of limestone, whose name is a sort of bastardization of the original name for the rock, Lithos Sarcophagus, flesh-eating stone. Bodies encased in the stone were apparently eaten away by the stone itself, although really, it was just because limestone is very porous and allowed decay to occur quite easily. All this was originally worked out by the Greeks and not the Egyptians. If you want to know more, by all means, re-listen to that brief episode from our early days but don't judge us too harshly. Usage of the sarcophagus pretty much continued unbroken through the centuries. You can find any number of them in use throughout the various cemeteries of the world, depending on where you are and local traditions. Possibly the easiest location to find some, though, is in Old English churches, or anywhere Catholic saints happen to be laid to rest. You can generally note their presence thanks to one very distinct feature— Often, though not always, there will be an intricately carved lid depicting what amounts to a lifelike statue of the individual interred within, particularly if that person was extremely high-ranking in society, say a king or lord or even a well-noted priest. Honestly, these things are more or less all over the place, and once you've seen one or two of them, you've pretty much seen the lot. There's only so many dead men in fancy armor or robes carved into marble that you can really look at before they all sort of blend together. Which is where the transi comes in. Some of these sarcophagi, if you look carefully, are much, much different than all the rest. Because some of them, 
depict the decaying corpse of whomever is entombed within, often in addition to the lifelike representation. Sometimes also called cadaver monuments or memento mori monuments, which means reminder of death, they tend to appear more often in churches than just out and about in your standard graveyard. And as their Latin name implies, they were done to serve as reminders to the general public that it really didn't matter how much of a much you were, you were still going to die and decompose rather gruesomely by the end of it all. Really though, they are terribly fascinating and for a number of reasons. First, they were very popular during the late Middle Ages and then almost not at all after that period. We imagine that at least part of the reason was that it doubled the expense of your burial and the other part being the changing sensibilities of folks as they left the Middle Ages and entered what would become the Renaissance. Second, the people depicted both in life and in decomposition didn't even have to be buried at the church in which their effigies were displayed. It was apparently common practice that a sufficiently famous or well-known individual would be on display, as it were, in a number of places, particularly if the details of their life had included important references to those same places. For instance, the cadaver monument of John Wakeman, abbot of Tewkesbury in the 1530s, is on display in Tewkesbury Abbey, even though his body is buried at Forthampton in Gloucestershire, where he served as the first Bishop of Gloucester. The third item of interest is how these depictions were done. There was nothing particularly neat and tidy about the transion display. The figures were shown in a variety of stages of decomposition. Some were skeletons, some were emaciated husks, and some were complete gruesome depictions of decay that one would think could only be achieved by having dug up the body again some months after the burial. Sometimes, the dead individual would be given the dignity of a shroud, but just as often, the bare body was shown along with depictions of worms, rats, and other carrion feeders. Sometimes, depending on what animals were depicted, you could work out either where the person was from originally, or where their body was actually buried. The French seemed to have a particular penchant for doing this to their kings and queens. Louis XI, Francis I, and Henry II were portrayed both as they were in life and as rotting corpses, but beyond even that, so were their queens right alongside them. Incidentally, those sarcophagus lids with all the writings and drawings on them that so often turn up in adventures, you know, like the one on Balin's tomb in Lord of the Rings, those are called ledger stones, and as much as they frequently turn up in fantasy, in the real world, there is likely to be inset into stone floors in cathedrals and churches to mark the resting place of the presumably dearly departed. So there you go, transi or cadaver monuments and ledger stones. Dress up your adventures in those to add a sense of the macabre and sinister to your adventures. Can you imagine if both the transi and the lifelike figure on the top were animated by magic? Would the party have to fight two bad guys with the same sets of powers? Or would they fight themselves to a standstill? Only one way to find out, we expect. Back in October, we covered one topic in two different parts. Our first episode was called Cadaver, in which we discussed the history of dead people as it pertained to scientific discovery. In our second, Anatomist, we talked about the impact of that research and what it meant for those of us alive today. In both episodes, we spent a fair amount of time discussing the Burke and Hare murders and how that single event changed everything about dead people forever. It was a fun little series, and you should definitely listen to it before you listen to this. Because, while we discussed Burke and Hare, and Burke and Hare, we really didn't do a lot to discuss the third member of their little setup, without whom they'd never have gone on their little killing spree, because it wouldn't have been profitable. Of course, we mean Dr. Knox. Robert Knox was a Scottish-born anatomist who became, along with several other prominent doctors, a lecturer on anatomy in Edinburgh. But before that, he was kind of a jerk. Probably after that as well, except more so. As a small child, he had contracted smallpox, which destroyed his left eye and left him permanently scarred. Possibly in consequence of this, he turned into a mean child who bullied his peers, both physically and mentally. 
In 1810, he began taking classes at the University of Edinburgh and took an interest in transcendentalism, which we'll discuss in a moment, but suffice it to say it was probably the beginning inspiration for what would later become one of his other problems outside of the whole dead bodies for cash thing. At university, he took an interest in the biological sciences, particularly the classifications of disease. However, for someone who was going to turn out to be so impactful to the world of anatomy, it's a real shame he failed his anatomy examination in his final year. Instead, he had to take the remedial anatomy class in order to pass with competency. Fortunately, his teacher for the remedial class was none other than the greatest anatomist in Britain at the time, John Barclay, which no doubt had a great influence on the young Knox. After a stint in the army at the Battle of Waterloo, Knox felt that the competent surgeon, or at least a surgeon who wished to be competent, would need a thorough understanding of anatomy in order to succeed. And remember, you and I might take it for granted that this should be the case, but at the time it was incredibly difficult to get the required training, especially in England, as we discussed in our episodes at the time. Knox was then sent to South Africa, where he did not distinguish himself particularly well. His duties were not strenuous while there, but he fell afoul of the commanding officers of the regiment and ended up being sent back to England more or less in disgrace. Possibly, part of his difficulty was that he disapproved of the white Boers contempt for the indigenous people of South Africa. Which sounds like a good thing, but stick around. This got him interested in observing and making notes on the various racial types he encountered. A year after his return from South Africa, Knox went to Paris to study anatomy under the great Parisian anatomists, who at the time had no shortage of cadavers with which to teach. After returning from his Paris studies, Knox was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh for his medical research efforts on zoological subjects, and submitted a plan to the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh for a Museum of Comparative Anatomy, which was approved. He was appointed curator and given a salary of £100, which is nearly £10,000 in today's money, or just about 13000 US dollars and that might have been a good place for Knox to stop and spend his career. But alas, it was not to be. Knox's former teacher, John Barclay, approached him the same year the museum opened and offered him a partnership in a private anatomy school in Edinburgh, a necessity because official teaching positions at the college were generally handed out as a sort of reward for friends of the town council and did not therefore result in competent teaching so much as cushy jobs and steady income for those deemed worthy. By the end of the year, Knox had more students than all the other private tutors combined. By then, though, Barclay had died, and Knox was in sole control of the school. Which is where Burke and Hare came in, in order to keep Knox supplied with sufficient cadavers for his still-growing student body and the number of lectures and demonstrations needed. Even though Knox paid for and directly benefited from the murders, he was not prosecuted, which did not please the general public at all, even though he was let off because it was decided he had never dealt with Burke and Hare personally. Well, at least the Royal College of Surgeons had had enough of him. They forced his resignation from the curatorship of the museum, and his army commissions were removed by forcible resignation as well. Still, Knox's classes remained popular. In fact, they grew even more popular after the execution of Burke than they had been before. A record 504 students passed through the school's doors before changes to Edinburgh University's anatomy curriculum and the Anatomy Act of 1832 meant it was much easier for schools and instructors to get legal cadavers and hold instruction of their own, and so student enrollment in private classes declined. So reviled was Knox that when the Chair of Pathology opened up at the university, 11 other professors refused to accept his application to the post and instead did away with the position altogether. After that, it was all downhill for Dr. Knox. He had trouble getting cadavers, moved the school to Glasgow, ran out of operating funds, and then falsified student records, which ended his ability to certify any further students. Shortly thereafter, he was expelled from the Royal Society, and his election to it was retroactively cancelled. With his luck run out in Scotland, Knox moved to London, failed to find a university posting, and became instead a medical journalist, speaker, and author, 
eventually securing a post as pathological anatomist at the Free Cancer Hospital of London, where he stayed until his death in 1862. But let's not leave it there. For there was more to Knox than just being a slightly wayward anatomist. He was also a transcendentalist. And before you begin imagining some sort of Victorian-era hippie, let's just say that his type of transcendentalism wasn't the same as the kind you are imagining. Knox's kind involved the idea that there was a basic sort of generic animal from which all others of a particular genus descended. To put it another way, there were four main ideas in what became known as transcendental anatomy. First, that there existed a plan among all the visible structures of the animal and plant kingdoms, and that it was this plan that determined function. Second, the plan acted as a force to maintain anatomical uniformity. Third, you could discover and learn this plan. And fourth, you had to have the desire to discover the underlying universal laws behind anatomical differences. In short, there was an ideal for all anatomy based on a single creature somewhere back in the historical record, and that by discovering the various laws governing the differences from that ideal, you could then reconstruct the original ideal creature. Which meant that as far as Knox was concerned, man was a genus, not a species. And that the different races of man were the various species under the genus of man. There was an ideal specimen somewhere back in history of man, and all the different races of man were descended from that perfect ideal, and therefore all less than perfect. And so, because of that line of reasoning, Knox wrote a book titled The Races of Men, in which he espoused his view that anatomically and behaviorally, race or hereditary descent is everything. And then went on to exaggerate examples for each racial group he had observed. To be sure, he listed the good along with the bad, but the main thrust was that each race was best suited to live in the environment where it had developed and could not survive out of it. And that, because of a race's environment, it was natural and correct that some races were better suited to, say, civilization and scientific and technological achievement than others, all while at the same time rebuking the Boers of South Africa for their treatment of the blacks there. That treatment was simply uncalled for. All that transcendentalism and transcendental anatomy, and everything he did to promote his ideas, especially as explained in his books, meant that Knox, in addition to all his other faults, was a racist. But not the sort of racist everyone thinks of when the word racist comes around for the holidays. Frankly, what Knox really didn't like were the Welsh, Scottish, and especially the Irish and he would just as soon have seen them eradicated from the face of the planet. Which just goes to show, it doesn't matter which race it is you don't like, it still makes you a racist. And there's no neat little bow to put on the story of Dr. Robert Knox, and no grand redress of justice to mark the end. He was, generally speaking, an unpleasant man with unpleasant ideas, and may or may not have got away with his part in terrible crimes. But then, by Dr. Knox's own reasoning, what can you expect from a Scotsman? Back in March, we talked about a variety of different topics. We discussed the dangers of cosmetics both then and now, the eventual deliciousness of a cup of hot chocolate, and as a lead-in to our April episodes, we gave the history of history according to Herodotus. However, our crowning achievement for the month was without a doubt the prediction of a major plot element of the otherwise mostly okay film Godzilla vs. Kong. Seriously, we were a month and a half early with Hollow Earth and no one even noticed. In any case, the episode as released dealt mostly with the history and science of a hollow earth theory and how Edmund Halley might have got a lot of stuff right, but also a fair few things wrong. Even so, Halley was a fascinating character who turned his hands to many endeavors in a variety of fields, 
you would do well to investigate his contributions in such interesting areas as stellar cartography, meteorology, and the ever-fascinating field of insurance annuities. Naturally, though, everyone is mostly familiar with the story of his comet, so much so that we don't really feel the need to restate it all here. Let's just say he went through historical astronomical records, noticed a cometary event that seemed to repeat itself every 76 years or so, and made a prediction aided in part by other scientific and mathematical luminaries of the time. It turned out he was right, the comet was discovered, and he got the comet named after him as a posthumous reward. Fair enough, that's pretty much how it worked back then. Put in the work, make a couple of educated guesses, discover a thing, and if you are correct, you get something named after you. At least, that was sort of how it worked. Or how we thought it should work, or maybe how we really, really hoped it would work. But of course it doesn't, and didn't. Not really. And we really hate to keep picking on Edmund Halley, but he is very nearly the ideal example of what we are talking about. See, everyone thinks it's called Halley's Comet because Edmund Halley discovered it and predicted its next arrival, which is wrong. And it's easy to see why it is wrong by asking the simple question, if Edmund Halley was the first to discover the comet, whose historical reports did he use to do it? You see? Someone had to discover it before him in order to write the reports that he would later use to do the math that made the prediction of the comet's return possible. It can't have worked any other way. Someone, or as it turns out, several someones, knew about the comet and had seen it with their own eyes long before Halley ever did. And, in fact, the earliest reports of the comet were made by astronomers at least as far back as 240 BCE. The comet gets Halley's name because he did the math and was prominent enough to be known by those in charge of naming it. We were introduced to Fibonacci numbers way back in the late 80s thanks to a show called Square One TV and a segment within that show called MathNet. MathNet was basically dragnet for up-and-coming math nerds. It taught essential math concepts and had lots of terrible puns. So naturally, we loved it. The show's two leads, George Frankly and Kate Monday, and no, we don't know who she is the rest of the week, would go around Los Angeles solving crimes and mysteries that involved lots of math. In a rare turn of events, the show was once accused of being too entertaining to be educational, which just goes to show what the state of educational programming was in the late 80s. Anyway, MathNet was serialized as several eight-minute episodes over the course of a week or so that presented the mystery and solved it with maths. One particular storyline from season two was called The Case of the Willing Parrot and featured a series of clues that eventually led to the deciphering of a Fibonacci number sequence to access a young man's college fund. If you aren't familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, it works like this. Write down the numbers 0 and 1. Then add them together, getting 1 again. As you progress, you are always adding the last two numbers in the sequence together to get the next number. So the next step is adding 1 and 1 and getting, we hope, 2. Add the last two, 1 and 2, to get 3. 2 and 3 to get 5. And 5 and 3 to get 8. Keep repeating the process as long as you like until you have written down all the Fibonacci numbers. Warning, you'll need a lot of paper and space and more pencils than have ever existed. Now, as you might expect, the Fibonacci numbers were named after a man named Fibonacci, who just happened to be a famous medieval mathematician from the Republic of Pisa in Italy. And before we even get into why the Fibonacci numbers shouldn't be named after a man named Fibonacci, let us just make it clear that Fibonacci himself shouldn't have been called Fibonacci because his real name was Leonardo Bonacci. So already the story is in trouble. All Fibonacci means is son of Bonacci. Anyway, his chief contribution to mathematics was to write a book called Liber Abaci in 1202. 
that made the Hindu Arabic numeral system so popular in Europe that it's still in use today. Prior to that, most things were done with Roman numerals. And you go ahead and multiply XVII by XIV and let us know what the answer is. And then work out how to do decimal places that way when you don't even have a decimal mark to indicate with. Fibonacci spent most of his early life traveling around the Mediterranean and learning things from the Arab and Hindu traders there. Almost the first thing he noticed was that they were able to calculate sums much more quickly and efficiently, often just in their heads, by using these funny little symbols and dots and things. Definitely faster than the folks back home still trying to remember how to spell 238 in Roman. So he took notes and wrote it all down and brought it home with him to Italy, where he wrote his book. It's CCXXXVIII, by the way. And yes, we looked it up. As part of the book, he used a Fibonacci sequence to illustrate a few points he was making having to do with the growth of a theoretical population of rabbits, generation after generation, that you couldn't do without a whole lot of extra difficulty with Roman numerals. And that sequence and those numbers were called Fibonacci numbers and sequences. But Fibonacci didn't come up with it himself, of course. It was the people he learned all the fancy numbers from who did. The people of India. They'd been using it since at least the 6th century CE. All Fibonacci did was recognize the usefulness of the numerals and provide an example of how to use them to the people of Europe. But since the people of Europe found out about it all from Fibonacci's book, they were, of course and obviously, Fibonacci's sequence of numerals. And who were these Indians to be telling people otherwise? And this is how it really goes. Newton's first and second laws of mechanics were originally put forth by Galileo, Hooke, and Huygens prior to Principia Mathematica. The Oort cloud was first proposed by Ernst Oppik in 1932, 28 years before Jan Oort did it. Hubble's law, based on observations that galaxies were moving away from each other, was derived by Georges Lemaitre two years ahead of Hubble. But look who got the telescope. Even the venerable Pythagorean theorem doesn't belong to Pythagoras. Babylonian mathematicians knew about it well before he came along. Why, there ought to be a law. And there is. It's called Stigler's Law of Eponymy. And it says, No scientific discovery is named after its original discoverer. Steven Stigler is a professor of statistics and popularized his own law in a 1980 publication by the same name. Except, and of course, it wasn't his, was it? Indeed, Stigler himself gave full credit for coming up with the law to sociologist Robert K. Merton, the father of modern sociology and the developer of the terms self-fulfilling prophecy and unintended consequences. In November, we hung out in the kitchen, as we're sure you remember. The reason? Well, the impending American holiday of Thanksgiving, of course. As we thought about the upcoming event, we realized we'd spent a lot of time in previous years celebrating the various foods we might encounter, and very little time at all considering the things that brought them to us. Which was, we felt, a bit unfair. So we kicked things off by looking at one of the biggest innovations ever made by humanity, the oven. Naturally, we had to follow that up with the vessels we used to prepare those meals in, pots and pans. And then we wrapped things up with a look at tableware. Now, there were probably a number of you who, upon hearing the tableware episode, began jumping up and down in your seats and proclaiming we had missed something. Something extremely obvious. Something delightful and whimsical. Something... Well, if we're honest, something so nearly useless that it amuses us any time one actually turns up. Of course, we mean the spork. For those of you who don't know, and really you should get out more except not this year, the spork is a hybrid utensil created by taking the best parts of a fork and spoon and throwing them out. Stick what's left over together and you have a spork. An eating device with not enough time to spear anything and not enough bowl to hold anything. 
You can find them wrapped in plastic in practically any restaurant that specializes in the sort of food that is best eaten quickly before you get a real good look at it. To be fair, though, they do have their uses. Schools and prisons like a spork because it's really hard to stab your fellow inmate with something so flimsy that even the points it does have will fall off under the slightest pressure. The military favors them, as do hikers and campers, because who wants to pack around a couple of extra ounces for separate forks and spoons when you're already lugging around a 50-pound pack of light camping gear? And the airlines love a spork because when passengers are all crammed in together in a flying sardine can, why not let's make things a little worse and the people a little more miserable just for laughs? But that's the thing about these little considered and not at all appreciated eating utensils. They seem like just about the worst way to eat anything ever invented in modern times. You wouldn't willingly pick up a spork if other normal options were available. However, if you roll time back to when the spork was actually invented, you'd begin to see that it actually had a place in among all the other tableware. And by rolling back time, we don't mean to 1951 when the word spork was trademarked, nor do we mean going back to 1909 when the word first appeared in the Century Dictionary. No, instead, we mean going all the way back to when the first patent for a hybrid combination spoon and fork appeared on the scene, the mid-1800s. U.S. Patent 147119 was filed by Samuel W. Francis of Newport, Rhode Island on January 22, 1874. In it, Francis describes what he calls a new and improved combined knife, fork, and spoon. And sure enough, there, laid out in proper detail, is something that is recognizably a spork. Well, it's certainly at least a spoon, though we aren't so certain you'd want to use it in the traditional manner. Imagine, if you will, the usual shape of the modern spoon. Longish handle, shallow bowl at the end. So far, so good. Now, centered at the front part of the bowl, add three tines, about a quarter of the usual fork length, and a fourth tine offset along the away side of the bowl if you're right-handed. It's a little visually awkward to look at since it appears a bit lopsided now, but it can still work. What doesn't work at all is the shelf of metal material attached to the away side that runs from the extra tine up along the curved edge of the bowl to near the handle. This is the knife blade, and if you've pictured it correctly, you'll immediately see the problem. There's no way to get the thing in your mouth without encountering the knife blade. All you can do is sip delicately at the spoon portion and nibble the tiniest bits off the very end of the fork bit. Oh, and only right-handed, please. Presumably, you could make a left-handed combined knife, fork, and spoon, but then you're buying extra silverware to accommodate the percentage of left-handed people that might eat at your table along with the righties. It's really too much of a hassle to be practical, but it is the first filed patent for what would become, once a marketing department got hold of the thing, a spork. But that's the curious thing about this patent. Not the drawing of the object, which is weird enough, but the name of the thing. Sure, the patent as finally registered says new and improved, but the application as written is for improvement in combined knives, forks, and spoons. Improvement, not new design for. The clear implication being that other designs for the same thing already existed. Samuel Francis was just making them better. You're probably aware, we should hope, that all manner of strange utensils have come to the table over the history of eating. Heck, there's some pretty odd ones still in use today, depending on what circles you travel and eat in. Crab forks and fish knives, tongs and dippers, and about three million kinds of spoons. All of which is to say that table utensils are constantly evolving and changing based on intended uses and the convenience of the end user. And more than a few have actually been about reducing the number of utensils needed at the table. So combinations of specific devices have been going on for hundreds of years. Which is why you get things like ice cream forks. 
It's essentially a spoon with half a bowl and three wide and deep tines where the rest of it should be. Used for spearing, we presume, melting chunks of ice cream from out of their container. And the terrapin fork, which, once you remember terrapin is another name for turtle, conjures all sorts of horrifically accurate images. It too was a spoon-fork combo, and it was often shaped like the creature it was used to consume. Both of which are but two examples of early pre-patent spork-like devices. Of course, you can't ignore the other combination utensils. There's the splayed, an Australian invented combination of the knife, fork, and spoon that has two hard edges on either side of a square spoon bowl, as well as tines, and was reputedly so popular that during the 1950s and 60s it was frequently given as a wedding gift. Naturally, there is also the knife and spoon combo called a spife, the chork, which, like its cousins the chop fork and the fork chops, combined various utensils with chopsticks, and let us not forget the ingenious invention that helps make all those trips to the corner store so worthwhile and refreshing while bringing a touch of winter to the summer months. The Spoon Straw Suitable for eating and drinking your favorite flavor of slushy. Usually located just near the sporks. Back in February, we focused a lot on the Silk Road and its effects on the world and history way back when the East first opened up to the West. We spoke at length about Marco Polo and his book, how the horse caused the whole thing in the first place, and how a silver tree is an excellent metaphor. Along the way, we also discussed the whole reason all these trade routes were called the Silk Road to begin with. It was, of course, all about the movement of silk, though, as we pointed out, this wasn't the only, or even the most important, thing to move along the roads. Still, silk was pretty significant, and in more than just the ways we spoke about in the episode. See, one of the things that made silk so impressive was the kind of clothing and cloth you could make with it. We're not talking about your typical silk sheets here, no sir. What we have in mind is the really good stuff. The Chinese, as you'll no doubt recall, had a monopoly on the production of silk for quite a long time. Only they knew how to raise the moths that produced the caterpillars that made the silk they traded for the horses they needed to take over and control the land they wanted in order to become as rich and powerful as they were. At least until the forerunners of the Huns showed up and spoiled things. Fortunately, depending on your point of view, a few hundred years later, the Tang Dynasty showed up and started running most of China, and they became just as wealthy and powerful, if not more so, than the Qin had been all those years before. And what better way to show how rich and powerful your dynasty was than by dressing richly and powerfully, and what better fabric to convey the message of wealth and power than silk? But ordinary silk wouldn't do all by itself. Those silk sheets and silk ties and silk handkerchiefs everyone wears these days to convince you of their wealth and power, those are nothing compared to what the Tang were wearing back in the 9th and 10th centuries. A silk thread by itself isn't much good. You can try wrapping yourself in it as is, but we expect that would lead to a lot of embarrassment and inconvenience. Instead, you have to weave it into a fabric from which you can then make whatever your little heart desires in the way of wearable clothes. What the Tang Chinese did was to develop a couple of ways of weaving that would have knocked your little silk socks off. In weaving, the idea is to interlock vertical threads called the warp with horizontal threads called the weft. Generally speaking, there are two sets of warp and one weft. The warps can alternate up and down positions, while the weft is passed between the two sets every time they alternate. In this way, the weaving is done, and the threads more or less lock each other in place. All cloth and most fabrics are made this way, and it's been going on almost as long as people needed clothes. By adding color or changing the types of thread being woven into the cloth, pleasing patterns can be made and different types of cloth obtained. 
the Chinese had worked out that the sort of thread used to make a satin weave could be alternated with the kind used to make a sateen weave fabric. And we'd love to go into the differences and distinctions of each, but we're headed to a specific destination on this bonus episode. And it also worked out that you didn't have to move every other thread in the warp. You could pick and choose which ones went up and down and captured the weft so that not only would interesting patterns be made, but actual pictures could be produced right in the finished material. The satin weave produced smooth, shiny patterns, while the sateen wave, because it used spun yarn instead of a single filament, would look flatter and be more durable. Not only that, but the fabric could be flipped over to see an identical, but reversed, picture. Combine the weaving technique with different colored thread, and you had some of the most impressive patterned cloth, called damask, that anyone had ever seen. It's incredibly complex to make, requiring intense concentration and careful work by hand. And the reason it is called damask, we will get to in a moment. The other very impressive fabric the Chinese came up with is called brocade. It first came about in the Warring States period of Chinese history, and it too is a woven silk fabric. But unlike damask, brocade uses an extra weft thread that has nothing to do with holding the fabric together. Instead, it exists to give the appearance of very careful, fine embroidery. The patterns and pictures produced by this method give the impression of being slightly raised up from the main fabric. Colors are bright and vibrant, and the patterns and pictures produced are sharp and distinct. Again, it's a very complex and detailed method requiring care and concentration to get right. One thread in the wrong place or of the wrong color can ruin the whole fabric. Naturally, to make all this weaving work properly, you need a loom. Basically, all a loom was, was a way to keep the threads organized into warp and weft and allow them to pass by and through each other as neatly as possible. By moving one part of the frame up and the other down, the warps could change position and the weft could be passed between them. By changing position of the warp again and passing the weft back through, you could gradually make progress by building up row after row of woven fabric. All of which was done by hand in China and elsewhere. Well, by two sets of hands, because by the time the Chinese were making damask a name, we will still explain in just a few moments, they were using a draw loom to do so. It required two people to operate, the weaver and a draw boy, whose job it was to control the harness that managed each warp thread separately in order to make the desired pattern. For the longest time, China was the place to go to get these sorts of fabrics. And then along came two monks, who you will no doubt remember from our sericulture episode. And off they went with the secrets of the silk moth to the Byzantine Empire, which, because it became so prolific at producing quality silk goods just like the Chinese, and was more centrally located, it soon became the new silk capital of the world, and it wasn't long before one of the cloths produced there became associated with the city of Damascus, the port through which it was shipped thereby becoming known as the Cloth of Damask. Now, the thing to know is that as these cloths, Damask and Brocade, grew in complexity and became more intricate and detailed, they became harder and harder to produce both quickly and accurately. It was highly skilled work, and it was far too easy to lose one's place in the process, move the wrong threads, and have to start over again. And as demand grew for them, it became imperative to find ways to produce the fabrics at a speed which would meet the demand. As a result, looms were incrementally improved over the years. Practically as soon as it was possible to do so, looms were powered by water wheel and then steam. The flying shuttle was invented to speed the process of passing the weft between the warps, while also allowing for the creation of much wider fabric and simultaneously reducing the manpower needed to run the loom. But still, mistakes were costly in both time and money, and the patterns were growing ever more complex, so errors were effectively increasing no matter what other improvements were made. And then one day, a French weaver and merchant named Joseph Marie Charles looked around his shop and decided he could do better, and that the way to do better was to take the human out of the equation entirely. 
Using a series of feelers connected to each thread, Charles took cards and punched holes in them, one card for each weft thread, that told the loom which warp threads needed to be raised in order to create the desired pattern. When a hole in a card passed over a feeler, the feeler would pop through the hole briefly raising the required thread and allowing the shuttle to pass through, eliminating the need for a person to manage all the threads over and over again and making the patterns perfectly repeatable. And Joseph Marie Charles, whose family, in order to avoid confusion among all the various Charleses in the family line, called his branch Jacquard, Joseph Marie Jacquard not only invented, with the help of the work of a few other people, the Jacquard loom, which greatly improved the process of creating brocade and damask cloth to his eventual profit, but also demonstrated the first punch card programmable machine. One of the earliest steps to creating a working computer. All because of silk. Hello and welcome to another footnote for our $10 supporters for topics covered in December of 2020. Except, except we sort of have a problem. See, December of 2020 was a bit of a weird month, episode-wise. There's not really a lot to work with. After all, we did two back-to-back -back lost episodes in the hopes of clearing out a bunch of little topics we had laying around. And clear them out, we did. There aren't any laying around to use. And then, we followed that up with two back-to-back -back holiday episodes in which we bundled up all these footnotes we had for a pair of nearly hour-long offerings. And that was a success. But that means we're stuck. There's no extras laying around because we've got cupboards that are now way too clean to be useful. So what to do? Frankly, the problem all comes down to planning. We barely know what we're doing from day to day, let alone working out some sort of master plan that covers the episodes we release over the course of the year. Besides, we have a terrible tendency to change our minds midstream because we fall out of love with one topic and in love with another. Rinse and repeat and you can see just how difficult it is to plan anything with any consistency. Impossible. Which brings us back here again. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that Angry was back on the writing staff, as this sure seems like one of his patented long rambling introductions, doesn't it? Except it's not. We're cunningly illustrating a point that is essential to the topic we are about to cover. The Fra Maro map. Sure, it doesn't have anything to do with anything that has gone before, but that's the whole point of the thing. See, prior to the Fra Maro map, there was a problem with trying to get around in the world. And that problem was religion. Not that religion was bad one way or another, but rather that religion had a much, much bigger part to play in describing what the world looked like prior to about the 1450s when Frau Murrow made his map. And that made it difficult to plan anything. If you are a fervent believer in things religious, you might get the idea that the world is just as your sacred text describes it to be. And you might, heaven forbid, take the opinion that any deviation from what your sacred text says is how the world is, is some kind of sacrilege or heresy. So you might, given that your religious institutions tend to frown on heresy and sacrilege, decide that in order to keep being on the good side of your God and your church, it's best to deny the evidence of your own eyes and experience about how the world really, really is. You might make maps that were more influenced by religious concerns than by actual geography. Which is a problem if what you are trying to do is sail from one place to another across a sea without missing. You'd much rather have a map that was accurate instead of one that was holy. For instance, maps of the time often placed east at the top of the map. Why? Well, because that was the direction of the Garden of Eden. Duh! But if you were using a compass to help you navigate, east isn't the best thing to have at the top of your map. South was. Well, at the time it was, because most compasses of the day indicated south rather than north. It just made orienting yourself on the map that much easier if south was at the top. 
Also, you'll be happy to note that Jerusalem was almost always the center of the map. Everything else had to be oriented around the center, and you'll no doubt immediately realize that the bulk of the world's known population, and therefore the majority of the people most likely to need to use a map, weren't centered around Jerusalem. They were in Europe, which meant a Jerusalem-centered map was about 75% useless to anyone wanting to travel and conduct trade in Europe. There was also one other problem Fra Mauro had to overcome, and this was very nearly akin to the religion problem. The maps of Ptolemy. Ptolemy created his maps in the second century, and they were, for the time, brilliant. Except, well, except that Ptolemy's maps were really just Ptolemy's book Geography, which probably originally came with maps, but which had long since lost those maps. So, based on the writings within the book, the maps had to be totally reconstructed by Byzantine monks around 1295, which meant that the maps not only weren't original to the book, they were also probably far inferior to the originals. But the thing about the Ptolemy maps was that they included longitudes and latitudes for all the places and points that were listed. Everything, everywhere, was pinned down precisely thanks to the system Ptolemy developed. And that sentence tells you exactly what the other problem Fra Mauro had to overcome was. See, Ptolemy was regarded as THE authority on what was where and he had cataloged everything anyone knew about at the time of his writing. Which meant that his maps and his geography were exactly as the world was, and therefore unchanging. And people believed that nearly as strongly as they believed the religious view of the world. There could be nothing else, and nothing Ptolemy had done could be wrong, because he was the final authority on the subject, even the church was more or less on Ptolemy's side eventually. If it wasn't in his book, it didn't exist. Which meant that traders, merchants, and other travelers were increasingly being surprised by things that Ptolemy hadn't accounted for in his geography. Surprise rivers and deserts, unlicensed islands and cities, even the occasional whoops, I didn't see that entire country there. Sorry. But when King Alfonso V of Portugal comes to you and your little Venice workshop and says, Hey, we bumped into an unregistered continent last week, and we think it's about time we had some maps that actually look like the places they are supposed to represent, don't you? The only answer you can reasonably give is a very humble, Yes, I'll get started on it right away. And then you go out and you look at all the maps you can find, and you listen to all the travelers you can listen to, and you compare all the notes you can compare, and you even pay someone to go out and look at things for you because you're a monk and can't just leave to go on the world tour. And then you very carefully write down absolutely everything about absolutely everywhere based on the best possible data you can find so that seven years later, you can turn to the King of Portugal and say, here, here is the best map I could make. And you hand him a huge map with very tiny writing all over it, detailing everything you would need to detail in order to get from point A to point B without getting lost, and you do it all in color and include a map of Ptolemy's solar system, a drawing of the Earth as a globe, and a nod to the Garden of Eden, just in case. And finally, finally, people can plan a trip and reasonably expect to get where they were going with a minimum of rambling. And hundreds of years later, when people can finally get out in space and look at the parts of the world you drew on your map, all they can do is be amazed by how accurate you were. Thank you for your kind support as always. We, and we hope you, are looking forward to another fine year of regular GM Word of the Week episodes, and we certainly appreciate your excellent support in making that happen. Talk to you soon.